Hello and welcome to this talk on Elizabeth Knight, a woman to be reckoned with. My name is Alison Daniel and I'm a final year PhD student at Southampton University and my research is looking at the law of coverture which was a law which applied to women in England and Wales when they got married um, from the Middle Ages right through until the 19th century. And one of the aspects of coverture was that the husband effectively had control of his wife's property. And I'm looking at how that affected women in their real lives and how this was interpreted and used by women authors writing fiction in the long 18th century. Now, one of the case studies that I've been looking at is a lady called Elizabeth Knight, and she owned Chawton House. And this talk is a little bit about Elizabeth. It's a little bit about what it might have meant to be a landowning woman at the time that Elizabeth lived. And um, some of the aspects of coverture which she encountered during her life and during the management of her many estates in the south of England. Now, Elizabeth Knight was born in 1674, which was during the reign of Charles II, and she died in 1737, which was during the reign of George II. So she lived through a number of monarchs and saw a number of huge changes during her lifetime. She owned a number of estates in the south of England, and she inherited Chawton in 1702 from her brother Christopher. The large amount of land that she owned and its accompanying wealth made her a very powerful person indeed. And this was something which, having studied her and looked at the documentation which she's left behind, I think she probably quite enjoyed and it was certainly something that she was conscious of. But as a female landowner, she was potentially quite unusual. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is how many women were landowners at the beginning of the 18th century. This is traditionally a very male role, landowning, and it's quite interesting to um, think about some of the issues which women would have encountered when they owned land, not least of which was that they were probably in a significant minority within the population as a whole. There's a big debate amongst scholars as to how many women owned land at any point in history. And there have always, always been fewer women than men owning land, partly because of the law of primogenitor. Now, this is the law which said that the eldest son, by default, if there was no other arrangement, the eldest son would automatically inherit his father's land. And up until the reign of Henry VIII, land could not pass by will, so it had to be inherited. Unless you um, conveyed the land during your lifetime, once you died, it was inherited by your heir at law. Now, if there were no sons, English law has always dictated that instead of the land passing out of the nuclear family and onto a collateral male relative, it should pass to a daughter if there are any daughters. So it's only if there are no surviving children within the nuclear family that the land will then pass outside that nuclear family. So there have always been women landowners simply because in cases where there were no sons, sometimes there were daughters. So women have always inherited, although on slightly different terms, to men. But many scholars have argued for a decline in the number of women landowners into the 18th century. And um, the reasons that they give for this are legal changes, meaning that land could now pass by will. So men could leave land to their male relatives rather than it going by default to their daughters. Um, there were other legal developments that happened during the 17th century, such as the famous entail, which you may have come across if you've been reading Pride and Prejudice or Sense and Sensibility. And this enabled people essentially to tie up their land in multi-generational trusts. And these usually excluded women from the landowning, although technically you could have a tail female where all the women inherited, 
just as easily as you could have had a tail male. There's no legal reason why you can't have a female entail. It just was societally considered inappropriate and didn't happen. Um, another reason why scholars think that there were very few or fewer landowners than there had been who were women during the long 18th century was that other forms of um, subsistence, so other ways in which women could support themselves, became popular during the 18th century. We saw the development of stocks and shares, for example. So women of the elite and landowning classes could be supported by investments rather than by landowning, which is how they had traditionally received money and income from their land. But this theory has been challenged quite recently um, by Dr. Bryony McDonough, um, who published her book, Elite Women in the Agricultural Landscape. And she has done a huge amount of research, not merely into women in the 18th century, but she has collected all the data available for women owning land from the Middle Ages right through to the 19th century. And her conclusions are quite startling and they suggest that in the 18th century, somewhere in the region of 10.3% of all the land in England was owned by women. Now, there are also, as well as this 10% approximately of all land being owned by women, she suggests that female landowners were present in the vast majority of parishes in her study. Now, these might not have been women who owned acres and acres and acres of land, but it does indicate that the idea of women owning land is not an alien concept for people in the 18th century. And when her findings were compared against those which she'd um, accumulated for the Middle Ages through to the 19th century, she found that there was essentially a continuum in existence whereby somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of all landowners at any one time were female. So McDonough is also suggesting that there were perhaps some developments in the early modern period, so the time between the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the 18th century that meant women were less likely perhaps to be traditional big landowners. But she also suggests that some of the developments that meant that they were less likely to inherit certain types of land also meant they were more likely to own and work and control other types of land. And she sums it up by saying that somewhere in excess of 3 million acres in England were owned by women in the later 18th century and more than 6 million acres across Great Britain as a whole. So that's a huge amount. So women are in the minority, but they are still there. They're not owning land on the same scale as men are, but it's at a level that I would suggest wouldn't really have been considered an oddity. So how did these landowning women like Elizabeth Knight see themselves? Well, there are some notable exceptions, but McDonough sees a tendency amongst female landowners to represent their estate management as an act of familial duty rather than a disruption to traditional gender roles. Although, she adds, they could subvert those gender roles and rework them for their own benefit if they wanted to. So, this seems like this could be taken as being a huge generalisation, um, but women of the period were attempting to reconfigure their landowning in terms which were socially acceptable. So, for example, they might say to themselves, well, I'm looking after this estate, but I'm only doing it until my oldest son is old enough to do it himself. Or I'm looking after this estate um, and I'm doing it as part of my duty to the family. Or, you know, this is my father's land and I'm looking after it in his memory. So she's suggesting that women would traditionally try and reconfigure the idea of land owning as something that would be acceptable for a woman to do. Now, the thing about Elizabeth Knight is that I don't think this applied to her. As I've said, she inherited Chawton in 1702 from her brother Christopher and he had inherited it in turn from their older brother, Richard. 
Um, they were Martins by birth, their surname was Martin, but a condition of the inheritance was that the owner would have to change their name to Knight. So that is how Elizabeth Knight became, took her name, and eventually the Knight name came down to Jane Austen's brother, Edward, and he was required to change his name to Knight in order to inherit the land. Now, Elizabeth Knight married twice. The first time was to her cousin, William Woodward, who I'm going to call Woodward, even though he did have to change his name tonight. And she probably married him round about 1704. So that is after she's inherited Chawton. The second time she got married was to a man called Mr. Bulstrode Peachy, who has to have one of the best names in, um, in, in the whole of history, I think. Um, but I will refer to them as Woodward and Peachy, just because it's going to be too confusing to have all these knights everywhere. Now, Elizabeth Knight didn't just own Chawton, but she owned a number of estates. Now, some came to her through the mother's, her mother's side of the family. They were called Lucna. And her first husband, William Woodward, had an estate in Egham. And she also owned houses in London and across the river in Southwark. Now, some of these properties she held as a life interest, so that meant she had the use of them for her life, but then they would refer back to the direct line, to the heir, to an, somebody else. She couldn't leave them to anybody else, essentially. But others, such as Chawton, were hers outright. Now, as I said in my introduction, marriage affected how women owned their property. When a woman married, her legal identity was absorbed into that of her husband. She was literally covered in her marriage. She couldn't make contracts or debts. And if she did, then her husband was responsible for them. She effectively made them in his name. She couldn't make a will without her husband's permission. And all her movable property belonged to her husband. He could dispose of it as he chose. He could even leave it to other people in his will. It, it never came back to her. And movable property would comprise things as, like stocks and shares, cash, um, household furniture, ornaments, silverware, anything, anything that you could pick up and move around. He couldn't dispose of his wife's land but he was entitled to any rents or profits that came from it. And coverture lasted until and unless the wife outlived the husband when her land would revert back to herself and she would become a single woman. Now, importantly, single women in England have always had the same legal rights as men. Most people don't understand this, but the reach of coverture and the effect that it had upon the perception of women and all women's rights and abilities to act within the public sphere was really quite curtailed. So the reach of coverture, although it only technically applies to married women, really affected the lives and the perception of women everywhere in England. Now, Elizabeth Knight was fully aware of the implications of her coverture and she was also aware that there were ways she could get round it and the marriage settlement was one of these ways that she was able to do this. On her second marriage to Bulstrode Peachy she sent a letter of instruction to her lawyers and this was written in her own handwriting and she outlines the terms that she wants to see in her marriage settlement. And these included to insist on the surname of Knight for herself and for Peachy, and to reserve her estate in Hampshire, which includes Chawton House, for her own use during their joint lives, and to reserve its rents and profits likewise. So she's getting to keep the rents and profits that would otherwise go to Peachy. And she says, and I'm quoting from the document, um, to be reserved to my own use, my estate in Hampshire during our joint lives. And if I desire it, the rents and profits to be paid to me or trustees for my own use only. So she's being very clear that she wants to keep control of the property. She wants to keep control of the profits 
of that land and that under no circumstances is Peachy to get his hands on it. Now to do this, she used something known as separate estate. She put this property into trust and because of that, it couldn't come under Peachy's control and she could continue to use it in exactly the same way that she did when she was single. The value of Knight's land was quite considerable um, and she kept, kept a close personal eye on her land and the administration of it herself. And another document that we have, again written in her own handwriting, is, and I quote, an estimate of my whole estate in Michaelmas 1737. And it gives her a total income from her land of 3,256 pounds, 10 shillings, seven and a half pence net. And of these, it's the Hampshire estates, including Chawton, which provide the largest single tranche of her income, amounting to £1,851.04. So how did she go about managing her estates? Well, it appears from her accounts and her financial reckonings in her own hand that she actively managed those estates herself, albeit with the help of her steward come attorney, Mr Mumford. She kept an eye on her tenants, her servants, and in her documentation, there are even receipts for deliveries of alcohol. The evidence suggests that she was a woman who was not only capable of administering a large number of estates, but she did so successfully and with a personal involvement in the process. This isn't the sort of woman that McDonough is regularly seeing in the um, historical record. Um, the sort who is acting out of duty managing their lands or managing their lands for the greater benefit of the family. Um, Elizabeth Knight was a woman who proactively managed her land because she knew what she wanted. There is a letter which I hope you can see on the accompanying PowerPoint to this, which is one of my favourite pieces of documentation from the Knight Archive, um, which is a letter instructing um, one of her um, her minions um, to go and actually cut down some timber. There's a dispute, there's a land dispute. Um, a farmer is saying that the wood owns to, belongs to him. Knight is saying, no, it doesn't, it's mine. And she sends somebody in, rather than litigate this, go to court or try and sort it out. She sends somebody in to cut the wood down and says that if the farmer interferes, it will be, and I quote, at his peril. And she finishes off with, P.S. I hope you got a good price for my bricks. So she is definitely on the case when it comes to her land. Now, one thing which land owning brought with it in the 18th century was political power. So Knight's estates were not just a conduit for income. They were also a source of political influence. And during the 18th century, there were two ways members of parliament were elected. The first of these was known as the county franchise, where if you owned land that was worth more than 40 shillings, you got a vote. Now, I don't know whether Elizabeth Knight had the county franchise. She certainly owned land that was worth more than 40 shillings. However, the second way was through the borough franchise. Now, this system um, permitted electors in the boroughs, uh, which could be urban areas, but could also be villages, to vote. And the borough franchise depended on whichever custom prevailed in the borough that you happened to live in. And these included some of the, the more interesting sounding ones um, were the pot wallopers, who qualified for a vote because they could fit a cooking pot on their hearth. There were Scott and Lot boroughs, where the payment of local poor and church rates was a qualification to vote. So it showed that you weren't right on the poverty line. Um, universities had franchises and freemen and corporation boroughs. So that if you lived, if you were the freeman of one of the big urban boroughs, for example, York or Bristol, you had a vote. Now, interestingly, women could vote. Before the 1832 Reform Act, which actually excludes, specifically excludes women from the franchise, women could vote. 
women did continue to influence politics after the 1832 Act, but they could only do so informally. Um, for example, Anne Lister, who you may have come across as Gentleman Jack on the, the recent BBC television series, um, she complained. Um, she, she used to make her tenants vote for whichever candidate she wanted to win. And um, when someone told her that she shouldn't be doing this, she said, well, how else am I um, my view is going to be represented in Parliament if I can't make my tenants vote the way that I want to vote because I have no voice. Um, but before the 1832 Act, before because the franchise was based on land ownership, women who qualified under whichever rule had the vote. Now, as I've said, Elizabeth Knight may possibly have had a vote under the county franchise. But there's intriguing evidence that she sought to control the votes on her Sussex estates. Now, they were part of the Midhurst constituency. And she does this in quite an extraordinary way. The documents point to an intriguing story. It's one we sadly don't have the evidence to resolve completely. But we knew, do know that Midhurst, the constituency which both William Woodward, Elizabeth's first husband, and Bulstrode Peachy, her second husband, represented as members of Parliament. Now, again, I hope you can see this on the accompanying PowerPoint. What we have here is, and I quote, an account of Madam Knight's mortgages and burgage votes in the borough of Midhurst in the county of Sussex. And it's dated 17th of February, 1721. Now, the burgage votes, as I've said, are a form of borough franchise. They arose from the ownership of a burgage, which was an area of land in a town for which payment was traditionally made to the king or the lord by the exchange of money rather than services. Now, these votes were not votes that Elizabeth Knight would have cast herself. If you can have a look at the the, the next slide. Um, they were votes cast by voters in the borough of Midhurst, but they were controlled by her. So this is why she's calling them her votes. Now, in some boroughs, there would be suspicious sales or long leases made to people who could obviously not afford it before an election. And then these properties would be reconveyed back to the original owner after the election for the same sum of money. And landowners, just like Anne Lister later on after the 1832 Act, used this to ensure that the properties to which the franchise attached had voters in them that were sympathetic to the landlord's cause. And therefore, the landlord's preferred candidate would win the election. Now, the date on these documents suggests that those occupying the properties were probably doing so in the longer term. So we haven't got this um, transfer and retransfer that we see in some constituencies. But the principle of packing in those who would back your preferred candidate, I think, is probably what's going on here. And if anybody has read um, Vanity Fair, you might remember that Pitt Crawley reckoned that he could make a clear £1,500 a year by selling votes on his estate. So, you know, this, this could be quite lucrative. So what's going on in these documents? It's quite complicated. So it states, the document states that on the 17th of February, 1721, Bullstrode Peachy paid Elizabeth Knight £875, and I quote, in full consideration of her votes and mortgages in the borough of Midhurst. Now, Peachy is, of course, Knight's second husband. What seems to be happening here is that Peachy is the banker. He has paid Knight to transfer the votes, which she controls, to somebody called Garton Orme. Garton is responsible for paying the conveyancing fee, but he can only do so once he's paid Peachy the loan. So this is land which is controlled by Knight, possibly on the basis of sale and resale or mortgage and redemption for political purposes. She is selling the land to Peachy via Gart Norm for political reasons. And she is selling the burgess, burgages with their obliging tenants, presumably, in order to influence the outcome of an election. Now, 
Elizabeth Knight's husband dies in October 1721. And at first sight, this looks as though she is transferring the votes before he dies, which would be extraordinary because in February, in um, the February before he dies, he is actually the MP for Midhurst. So she would appear to be transferring her votes away from her husband, the sitting MP, to Bullstrode Peachy, who later becomes her second husband. However, sadly, it's not quite as exciting as that because the calendar changed. Um, in the mid 18th century. So chronologically, the, the year instead of starting in January would start in March. So the um, October 1721 occurs um, before February 1721, which is quite complicated, but it means that she's transferring these votes after her husband has died. But the story is still very intriguing. Not only is this woman in control of a number of votes, selling them on, um, it's interesting because the Knight family were Tories. So they very much supported one political party and Bolstro Peachy, who was due probably at least in part as a result of the transfer of these votes to be returned an MP at the next general election, was a Whig from a Whig family. In fact, his father unsuccessfully contested the Midhurst seat a few years previously. So was Elizabeth Knight here throwing in her lot with the political opposition in defiance of her family heritage? Well, you know, that, that would be quite a bold move. Um, it could just be a simple financial transaction. Um, perhaps she needed the money to pay for something specific. But there are a number of tantalising possibilities. It may even be that she was somehow getting her ducks in a row for a second remarriage. I mean, who knows? It's, it's impossible to say. Um, certainly she was not the only person that Peachy bought votes from. Um, he bought some from Lord Montague um, for the same constituency. And this would undoubtedly have been the same sort of dealing that he was used to. Gart Norm's role is less certain. He eventually becomes the MP for Arundel, which is, of course, also in Sussex. Um, but his father had also once been the MP for Midhurst, so he had very, very strong political connections. Um, Gart Norm also has something of a chequered history. Um, he apparently or allegedly murdered his first wife and threw her body down a well. And when there were excavations in the 19th century, in the graveyard where his wife was supposed to have been buried, they did in fact um, pull up a coffin which was weighted down with stones which had no body in it, so maybe he did that. Another story associated with Gart Norm was that he attempted to take his daughter's inheritance that had come to her through her late mother, attempted to take that away from his daughter and while she was in a carriage riding to London to oppose his application to the Court of Chancery to do this, he paid for a highwayman to hold her up to delay her so she couldn't make her application. Um, so certainly he appears to have been a, a rather interesting character and um, somebody that it's rather intriguing to think was associating with Bulstro Peachy and Elizabeth Knight. But whatever the background, um, what's clear is that Knight is doing the transfer of these votes by herself. William Woodward and whatever he would have thought about it, what her family would have thought about it, is not part of the consideration. Um, this seems to be between her and the two men, and it's just a shame that the reasons for this transfer remain so opaque. Finally, I'd just like to talk a little bit about her legacy. So as well as having very decided views about what should happen to her land whilst she was alive, um, Knight also had um, some thoughts about what should happen to it after she died. She had no children from her first marriage to William Woodward. And when she married Peachy for the, for the second time, her second marriage in 1725, she was 49 years old. So she might possibly have managed to get pregnant, but it was extremely unlikely. When she died, her will gave provision for a male entail. So that meant that her land was to pass down to the closest male relative. So ideally father to son, but if there were no sons, then it would pass to the nearest collateral male outside the nuclear family. However, 
this was not always her intention. And indeed, she seems to have been open to having a woman inherit her estates. Again, I hope you can see the slide. There should be one with the draft marriage articles. Um, this draft settlement provides, and I'm quoting from it, the son and sons of the said Bulstrode Peachy on the body of the said Elizabeth Knight, his intended wife, lawfully to be begotten severally and successively according to their priority of birth entail male. So what it's saying is that the oldest son will inherit, they're presuming they're going to have lots of sons, um, the oldest son will inherit. Um, if he dies, it will then go to the next son. If he dies, it will go to the next son and so on and so forth. However, in the event that there are no sons to inherit the estates, the document allocates the remainder, and again, I'm quoting, to all and every daughters of the said Bulstrode Peachy, on the body of the said Elizabeth Knight, his intended wife, lawfully to be begotten, and the several and respective heirs of the body and bodies of all and every such daughter, lawfully issuing equally to be divided between them. And if there shall be but one such daughter, then to the use of such only daughter and the heirs of her body, lawfully issuing. So it would appear to Knight appear that whilst Knight was not willing to overturn convention and disinherit any sons in favour of her daughters, in the absence of male children, she was content to leave her estate to female offspring. And this was to be done in preference to an entail that would transfer her land to collateral male heirs. Whilst it was a requirement that anyone inheriting should take on the surname Knight, the draft marriage settlement shows a distinct openness on Knight's part to consider a direct female heir. And it was only at the time of her own death, when a direct heir was no longer a possibility, that she resorted to the tail male and set up an all male entail, a multi-generational trust that excluded women from inheriting and which would eventually mean that the knight land, including Chawton, passed to Jane Austen's brother Edward. So in conclusion, the historical evidence suggests that there is no clear um, conclusions to be drawn as to how female land ownership was perceived during the 18th century. Um, women may have seen it as a duty or attempt to um, pretend that they were only doing it as part of their, their duty to their family. Um, but there were also women around like Knight who were obviously very good at managing their land and took an active, technical, in-depth interest in doing so. Women were in a minority of landholders. There is, there is no dispute of that. Um, and approximately 90% of all land from the Middle Ages through to the 19th century was owned by men. This meant that any women with control over real property, so that is land, it was, were not conforming to the norms of land ownership. And as had been mentioned above, some women probably did feel the need to reframe their work in more feminine terms, but Knight was not one of these. She was an astute manager of her land and of all the assets connected with it, including the votes. We don't know what the quid pro quo was with those votes, but I'm convinced that there was one. She was even happy to leave her land to a daughter rather than to a collateral male relative. But when she knew this was not going to be possible, she resorted to a more traditional allocation of the land and left it to the male line. However, I think she was definitely a woman to be reckoned with. And whilst we can't ever be certain that Jane Austen knew about Elizabeth Knight, she certainly visited Chawton House where Elizabeth Knight's portrait was hung. And she also made a virtue of including a number of very strong landowning women within the pages of her fiction. And I think it's really important, although perhaps we might not wish to spend a lot of time with Lady Catherine de Burr, there is no indication from Austen's writing that Lady Catherine mismanages her estates or she is a bad landowner. So in that sense, perhaps Austen is tapping into the heritage of Elizabeth Knight, whether cautious, consciously or unconsciously, and um, demonstrating through the pages of her fiction 
that women could be good, competent landowners, even if they needed to be reckoned with. Thank you very much. Bye bye.